one of the world's oldest industries is among the last to embrace digital transformation. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Paul Maybray, CEO of Emetry. Welcome, Paul. Uh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it, Tanya. Give us a brief summary of your background. Uh, you've been in the industry for a while. Um, explain what you've done in the past and what Emetry does. Yeah, I'm kind of the uh, old guard of wine and tech, uh, despite the baby face. So I've uh, started uh, two of the most successful wine uh, tech BDB companies. The first one was uh, e-commerce SaaS, um, and the second one was a social media listing, social CRM platform. And now I'm in charge of a customer insights company. So a lot of fun going through the, the history of books. Yeah, we have. And, and, and the wine industry has one of the oldest. Uh, we certainly, we've been drinking wine for a very long period of time. So as wines keeping up with, with technology, you've in fact said that we live in the most competitive market in history. Is wine keeping up and explain that? Uh, you know, wine is definitely not keeping up in the technology side. I think we are probably the last industry to not be changed by the internet. That's saying a lot, by the way, there's a lot of industries out there. So um, I'm not, there's a lot of factors influencing that, but um, there hasn't been a great change in the wine industry. I think our biggest company that we've ever produced is about a $110 million company. So if you think about that of an online company, uh, you know, let's use uh, Zappos as an example. When they sold to Amazon, I think there were $1.3 billion in sales. So that's a pretty big difference. And I would have thought that uh, selling wine online would come before shoes online because you have to try them on, but not so much. Why isn't wine keeping up with all of the digital assets that are out there? Um, where's, where's the miss? Yeah. You know, I think first of all, um, it's, you know, using jobs to be done, you know, what's the job the technology company solving? Um, you know, that philosophy is something that, uh, most wine technologists don't follow. They, they try to bleed their passion into, uh, the internet. And there's only a very small part of the audience that really goes into that nerdy part of wine. But when you get to be a wine nerd, you think it applies to everything else. Um, also it's a very small even though the industry itself is big on a consumer basis, um, uh, the amount of customers that pay money, you know, wineries or wine, it's a very small group of customers. So the TAM is really hard to achieve, um, total addressable market. Um, and I think that, that that stifles people. And then it's a very insular community. So you're either an insider or an outsider. So to break into wine tech, even if you have the most genius idea in the world, the wineries are kind of like, I don't know, we don't know you very well. So that slows down innovation for sure. Is it preventing sales or, I mean, where, where is, is the gap? Uh, it's preventing a lot of things. It's preventing sales, it's preventing content, it's preventing a myriad of different factors of innovation that we're seeing happen in all the other industries. There's no marketplace for wine. I mean, it's really a struggle out there. Um, you know, it's fascinating how many, in, in, you know, companies have come and failed, but I'm, I'm hoping that we'll see a change here pretty soon because the wine industry is actually ready for it, I think, for the first time ever. So, I personally use a wine app. What is your opinion uh, of some of the consumer wine selection apps? Yeah, I think there, there's two of them that are really great, maybe three. Um, and and their, their job is to really help you choose a good bottle of wine at point of purchase, right? You're standing in front of a wall of wine, maybe 100, 150, 250 different products. And most people don't know all those wines. And their job is to tell you if you're getting a good price, uh, if you're picking one other people like, or even at worst case, you know, helping you kind of guide, say, oh, I kind of like wines with blackberry or cherry. And I'm, oh, oh, everyone says this has blackberry and cherry. So I think they're actually excellent tools. Um, how they monetize, um, how they're doing the job to be done for the consumer still leaves some room to be desired for, but they're working on it, I think. Will wine e-commerce have the same effect on brick and mortar wine retailers as maybe, I don't know, general e-commerce has on the physical retail itself? Yeah, you know, we've been a little slower to get wine e-commerce for a couple of reasons. Um, wineries have done a great job, but uh, retailers have not gone in because of all the regulations. Uh, but we're seeing some big changes coming up to the Supreme Court um, where it's going to let retailers sell across state lines. That's kind of been a, a regulatory barrier that we haven't overcome. Um, but one of the things that we've never encountered, no industry has encountered like this, is our industry, once that happens, Amazon the sleeping giant is going to come in a very big way and we've never seen no industry seen an Amazon like the wine industry is going to see an Amazon not only does it have its own retail background but it owns all those whole foods who stock hundreds of bottles of wine and that has buying power plus e-commerce plus cross state line shipping is going to be something that we're going to have to figure out very quickly. So 
to what degree does the huge number of wineries and brands have on the ability for big wine to emerge? Well, big wine is there. I mean, there's obviously big brands that have like uh, large volumes at the low price point, um, but they don't really have all the high price points, right? So the long tail of wine is really big across small boutique producers all over the world. Um, in the United States, there's about 10,000 wineries, 20,000 brands. That's a, you know, it, it, it's small as a footprint, but you think about that, that's a lot of products on the shelf. I think uh, uh, last year alone, we had a quarter million wines come into the market from both domestic and international. And if you kind of abstract that to any other uh, consumer good, we don't have 250,000 types of milk, 250,000 types of cereal, butter, bread. I mean, it's pretty unique. You know, we talked a little bit about apps and you mentioned apps. And I think certainly as a tool, as a consumer, it's made me a better consumer. It's made me more educated. I certainly understand uh, what's available and I can compare prices. So there's all aspects of purchasing wine that's helped me. What about social media in general? Are, are wine connoisseurs using social media and, and, are, and are wineries using social media to collect data on their consumers? So I would say the wine connoisseurs are definitely using social media for a myriad of reasons, whether they're uh, sharing a bottle they had or talking among themselves in any community, like any, any, any consumable, right? I think the wineries are pretty slow to adopt all technologies, including social media, even though they had a big push for a while, but we're just still struggling. Now, the big, large wineries are definitely increasing their acumen in terms of how they use and leverage social media, but it's still um, fairly nascent compared to every other industry, sadly. What are the areas of biggest digital opportunity for the wine industry today? Ooh, that's a, that's a interesting question. Well, I think that e-commerce and sales and marketing technologies, any of those kinds of technologies that can help wineries do a more effective job or wine retailers. I think CRM is a fascinating problem in the wine industry, especially at the winery level. Um, no other industry has CRM like wineries, meaning from everything from a hospitality where you go into a tasting room and they expect to know who you are, all the way to e-commerce plus subscription model. These are three different kinds of core businesses they want to integrate as one single one. And what I mean by that is if you buy from Gap Online maybe seven years ago, you couldn't return it in the store. You had to ship it back in, if you remember. Now, even if you buy Gap Online and you walk into the store and return it, they don't know who you are, what pants size you wear. They don't treat you like a, they don't know that you're a subscription member of their Gap. They don't have that, but you know what I'm saying, a Gap subscription. This cross-channel problem is what the YFCs are really striving to solve. Um, which is actually ahead of all of retail. And I think it's fascinating. It's really that 360 degree customer view that all of us optimally want to get to, but wineries are more ahead of it because they have that multi-channel sales organization. Really cool stuff. Yeah. What is it that you've discovered about the wine consumer based on your data and data and analysis? Yeah, we've discovered a lot of things. Um, I think the, the most revealing piece of it was that um, the broad audience of wine consumers really don't care about wine the way that the wine lovers care about wine. So there's a huge um, a myopia associated when you become passionate about wine. You're like, oh my God, everyone thinks like me. They talk Blackberry, Cassis, Brambley, and all these weird tasting notes. But the regular consumer is like, hey, I want a bottle of wine with my wife. Hey, you know, we're going to have a bottle of Cab with a steak tonight. There's not that... That, that real deep want or desire to get engaged with wine the way that the industry thinks it should. It's more part of a, an occurrence. It's more part of an event. It's more part of a social setting than it is an individual passion thing. But if you think about other industries, it's the same, right? Knitting or anything, there's a vocal minority, um, which is wine overlays that minority as if the majority thinks that way. I've heard you say that millennials are not big wine drinkers. What do you attribute that to? Yeah, there's a lot associated with that that we're getting out of the data. Um, one of the first ones is that they are, they've got so many choices now that they didn't have before. So whether it's craft spirits to kombucha to coffee. So we're fighting for the mouth share cannabis now. Um, so all these different pieces, right, that we're trying to get. And then we're fighting against buzz per buck, right? Like, you know, right now the millennials don't have the same economic means as the boomers and maybe even the Gen X. So if I want to spend my money on something that's going to, you know, do the job properly or, you know, at least give me the best quality for the price point, right, that I can enjoy for a period of time. So those are all kind of competing factors, dollars that they have to spend, disposable income, plus the selection set of everything um, is pretty challenging. How can technology help wineries make smarter product distribution decisions? 
Yeah, that's pretty easy, I think. So we've had great stories about large wine groups looking at social to mine the data, say, okay, we're about to launch a brand. How should we look at this, uh, let's call it Chardonnay? You know, should we try to make it more buttery? Should we try to make it less buttery? How do we work with the brands to, or the product to make it what the consumer wants? Which labels are hot rising, which ones are falling, what names, what flavor profiles? So some of the bigger brand companies are definitely using that social data to inform their product decisions, which is really sexy and cool to me, at least. I think that's fun. All right, Paul, I have to ask the question. It's always been on my mind. How important is the label in purchasing wine? Do we really purchase wine based on the artwork or the flavor? Uh, so we purchase based upon um, the type first. So we go into the store saying, I want a good glass of white or red or a good glass of Chardonnay or Cabernet. And then next is the label pretty much in, in most cases. So yes, that was a beautiful label, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it is, right? Yeah. All right. I'm, I'm just as guilty as the next person on those sometimes. You know, if Paul, somebody wants to connect with you, maybe they want to find out, maybe they have a software tool that they want to introduce into the industry. Yeah. Or they want to find out more about your work. How can they do that? Yeah, I'm on Twitter all the time at P Maybray, uh, P M A B R A Y. Um, I love Twitter; it's my great conversation, and I'm happy to entertain. And in fact, um, one of my ways I give back to the wine tech industry is anyone could have a half an hour. I have a slot every day that anyone in the world can call me, and I'm happy to give them, tell them where I stepped on the landmines of my startups. So, and you can find more of my interviews right here, or go to TanyaHall.net. Thanks for watching.